afternoon, my dear brothers and sisters and young people, and to our greater audience, though I did have an email last night to say for a brother in Australia, he wasn't going to stop up till half past two in the morning even to listen to me. So uh, <laughs> there is a limit, there is a limit. But it is wonderful that we can project these talks, hopefully, uh, around the world. So it is shared with our brothers and sisters. So in our first two talks, uh, Brother Ken has been looking at the resurgence of Russia and Brother Stephen has been looking at the revival of Germany and the German Pope and the Vatican and the importance of the partnership between them. And so we've been concentrating in the first two talks on things which have to do with Europe. So I thought in this Milestones update we would concentrate on things which concern Israel and the Middle East. So we're going to look, first of all, at Israel, not just particularly at the caste-led uh, war, but uh, generally a picture about Israel, and then look at that wider, thrilling picture that's taking place in the Middle East at the moment, where the alignment of the nations is changing, so that we have pro-Israel nations, Arab nations, uh, and those who uh, align themselves with Iran. Uh, and it's wonderful after all this time to see this change, which is what Bible students have been looking at for for a long, long time. And then we shall look at the financial crisis just briefly and see the implications for ourselves and finally close with an exhortation. So that's the ground that we're hoping to cover this afternoon. So the prophetic background that I want us to look at to peg the things that we're going to be looking at are two things. The chapter that we read talks about the king of the south and the king of the north, uh, as related in Daniel chapter 11. And also the words, and Brother Ken referred to them in Ezekiel chapter 38, which refers to a group of nations who are in opposition to the invasion of Gog. So those are the two areas that uh, we want to just briefly look at. So just a bit of history, uh, Daniel lived to see the Medo-Persian Empire take over from the Babylonian Empire. This was the silver of Nebuchadnezzar's image or the vision of the seven little four beasts in Daniel chapter 7. This is the Medo-Persian bear. Uh, and so this is where Daniel had got to. At the end of his life, the Medes and the Persians had taken over. And in Daniel chapter 8, just turn back to Daniel chapter 8 because that's uh, what we've just got to look at for a few moments. Daniel chapter 8 is telling us the history of how this Medo-Persian empire will be taken over by the Grecian empire uh, and then the Roman. And in fairly simple symbols, these matters are encapsulated in that chapter. And chapter 8 has a picture of two animals... Persia, the kingdom of Persia that Daniel had arrived at, uh, is depicted by a ram. And the new kingdom that's going to take over from the Medes and the Persians is depicted by a he-goat. And the significant thing about this goat was its horn. It had a notable horn. And in Daniel chapter 8, he sees this ram with the notable horn coming against the... Um, the, the goat, sorry, the goat with a notable horn coming against the ram and conquering it. Uh, and this symbol of the notable horn is one which rooted in history. This is a depiction of Alexander the Great uh, riding to victory upon his favourite horse, Bucephalus. And in a, a, an amazingly short period of time, this Greek man conquered the Persian Empire. And interestingly, he is depicted, when he had conquered the Persian Empire, as wearing a headband. If you see on there a headband on his head, and we just enlarge it, that depiction there is of a ram's horn. So he seemed to recognise in the symbology that he had now taken over the ram kingdom. He had made it now into the Greek Empire. But his kingdom didn't last very long. His rise to power was very rapid, 
Hence the aptness of that third picture which describes the work of Alexander the Great as being a leopard with its four heads. Um, and a leopard works very swiftly, and Alexander the did, did, because it was at the age of 32 that he had died. He had conquered the whole of the Persian Empire and died by the age of 32. And in the vision, that's depicted by the horn, the notable horn, being broken. And the account in Daniel chapter 8 uh, goes on to say in verse 8 that eventually four horns came uh, and took the place of that one horn, depicting the time when the Greek Empire was divided into four regions under the four different generals of, uh, that uh, fought with uh, Alexander. So it was divided into four and the prophecy depicts that so clearly with four horns arising and taking their place. But two of those horns were of interest to the Bible students because they uh, impacted upon the nation of Israel. And it was the power to the north which became known as the king of the north, the Seleucid Empire, and the power to the south, the king of the south, the Ptolemies, who revolved around the nation of Israel. Israel was piggy in the middle between these two powers. Although they were both Greek um, generals, there was um, conflict between them, uh, and Israel suffered being the one in the middle. But we have the picture there of, of a power to the north and a power to the south of the nation of Israel. And then as the prophecy goes on in verse 9, it, it talks about a little horn coming out of one of the horns. Now, don't confuse that with the little horn that Brother Stephen was looking at, which belongs to chapter 7, which was describing the papal power. This isn't describing the papal power. This is describing the military power of Rome. This uh, vision is very much as how the empires would move onwards on a military scale. This is talking about Rome, firstly a united empire, and then when it was split between east and west, it became very much the symbol of eastern Rome, where the emperor reigned from Constantinople, where the military might of Rome was based in Constantinople. Uh, and today, as Brother Stephen has taken us to, it is Russia who has taken over that role of being the little horn power, the military power, uh, the little horn of chapter 7, as the Vatican has been the little horn of chapter 6. So when we come to the different symbology of Daniel chapter 2 and the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, these two powers... Uh, the king of the north and the king of the south, aren't depicted in this image. It's only concerned with the king of the north power, with its two legs, its eastern dragon, and its western, the beast. Uh, and we're looking to the time, and Brother Stephen has hinted at it, that they are in the process now of east and west coming together. Putin and Medvedev and uh, Germany especially, and France, are working towards a security pact which will unite them together. So that is the power that is arising before our eyes, the king of the north power. That's the power that's going to come down into the land of Israel uh, and take Israel, and there to be destroyed by Christ and the saints. So what we're, what we're interested in is the power that's in opposition to that confederacy, the king of the north. So we have to the north of Israel, the king of the north, but we have this power to the south, originally based in Egypt, but based in that region, the king of the south, as depicted in Daniel 8 and in Daniel chapter 11. We know that is, in the latter days, a king of the south power. Now, this is the same power that is depicted by Ezekiel in his uh, verse 13. This power to the south of Israel, who is opposed to the power to the north, who's intent on taking Israel. And so, if we just turn to Ezekiel in chapter 38, um, go the right way, and in verse 13, these well-known words, I've got them up on the screen, Where's it gone? 
Oh, I pressed the wrong button. Yes. Dear, that's a bit alarming, isn't it? Um, all on the press of a button. Right, so there we have a picture of Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lions thereof, saying to Gog, Art thou come to take a spoil and a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Now, we have in the past, and I must confess, I have more concentrated in reading this verse at looking at the merchants of Tarshish uh, and all the young lions thereof, and not taking a lot of notice of Sheba and Dedan, apart from giving us a geographical location to indicate the region of the world where these merchants of Tarshish uh, and all the young lions will be operating. But as we move on in time, we now see the importance of exactly what Ezekiel recorded. What Ezekiel recorded was that it's Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and the young lions who say to Gog, art thou come to take a spoil and a prey? Now, that's a quite significant uh, emphasis, change of emphasis for us. It indicates that these Arab powers are, are now siding friendly with Israel and are opposed to this Gogian invasion. And this is a wonderful thing, as we shall see when we look at the next part, that there has been this shift in uh, attitude of the Arab, some of the Arab nations to Israel. So what Ezekiel is telling us, as well as the merchants of Tarshish and the young lions thereof, I'm not detracting from that part of it, we should also find that the Arab nations in that territory will be opposed to this northern invasion. So we need to know, well, where is Sheba and Dedan? And I just put this comment uh, up on here. Just as Brother Stephen um, took us to, uh, no, uh, Brother Ken, um, took us to uh, Russia and how Russia is protecting the people who are in her confederacy, we shall see there's a similar picture in the Middle East, that there are these Arab nations who are looking to Tarshish and the young lions to be their protector, to supply them with their military hardware so that they can uh, strengthen themselves against the threat of Iran, as they see it at the moment. So it's an interesting counterbalance. So Sheba and Dedan. Well, we find there are two Shebas and Dedans. Uh, this is the one descended from Ham through Cush uh, and Sheba. And coming to Rama, we have Sheba and Dedan. Now, just looking at the Dedan part of it, uh, in Ezekiel 27, don't look at it, it's up on here. But it talks about the men of Dedan were thy merchants. Many isles were thy was the merchandise of thy hand, or the traffic of many coastlines were thy hands. They brought thee for a present horns, tusks of ivory and ebony. Ezekiel 27 is a fascinating chapter, talking about all the different nations who were trading with Tyre. And, and this particular men of Dedan, they seem to be uh, merchant people, people going out to many isles and bringing back uh, ivory and ebony. And ivory and ebony we associate with India. That's where the uh, true ebony uh, is to be found, the Ceylon ebony um, in India or Ceylon. A wonderful wood which you can carve. It's heavier than water. If you put it in water, it sinks. Um, in fairness, there is ebony to be found in Africa. There is an African ebony tree. And in fact, in some of the tombs in Egypt, the remnants there, understandably, are ebony from uh, the African tree. But generally, ebony we associate uh, with the east, with India and that region there. And so we place Dedan, the Didan descended from Ham. Um, this is a little quotation from this uh, Bible dictionary. Didan, the place where they resided, is believed to be identical with Daden of the Middle Ages, now called Bahrain, in the uh, Arab deserts, an island on the western shores of the Persian Gulf. So w we stick them over there. Um, and from there, they traded in their ships uh, across to India, brought stuff back, 
and then went across the country to Tyre and traded in the markets there. So the other Sheba and Dedan uh, is descended from Shem uh, through Alphaxad and Tira and Abraham through Keturah and uh, eventually come to another Sheba and Dedan. And again, we find reference to those in Ezekiel chapter 27 and verse 20. Uh, they were merchants in precious clothes for chariots. And in an earlier chapter in uh, Ezekiel, we have them being linked with the region of Timan, uh, describing the destruction of God upon Edom. I will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Timan, and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. Or one can translate it, uh, I will make them desolate from Timon, and they shall fall by the sword unto Dedan. But it doesn't matter. It, it, it shows us that this particular Dedan is situated near to Timon. Um, if we just uh, click onto this map here, there is Timon. And so the other Dedan uh, seems to be located in that region there. So we've looked at the Dedans. What are the Shebas? Well, the one descended from Ham. Uh, some authorities say that he stayed close to his father, uh, Rama, who was uh, in that region there. But the majority of people associate uh, the Hamatic Sheba down in the bottom there. Now, this is also where we find the other Sheba, the one that's descended from Abraham, this is where the Queen of Sheba, she is related through uh, Abraham and Keturah. Uh, and we come to the conclusion that the two Shebas from the two different branches, one from Ham and one from Shem, seem to have mingled themselves uh, and to be found in this region there. And it, it's interesting, the word Arab uh, is derived from this word Ereb, meaning a mixed multitude. And very largely the tribes did mingle these uh, nomadic tribes did mingle. So we have two Dedans, but we only have one Sheba because they seem to have mingled there. And uh, so that gives us our region of where Sheba and Dedan is. Uh, Tyre, Tarshish, uh, I don't propose to dwell long with that, and you've seen a similar map to this one. Our traditional understanding of Britain being the old line and America and Canada part of the young lions with Australia and India. But the characteristic today of these former uh, countries associated with Britain is that they are all friendly with Israel. This is a remarkable sign of the times. It seems strange that countries, you know, from all over the world are friendly to Israel. But that's what we would expect if our traditional understanding is correct, that the merchants of Tarshish, Britain, and her young lions, the Commonwealth countries, should be in this Middle East region and opposed to the invasion of Israel. So with that background, I just want to now look at present events. Uh, when looking at Israel, I want to look at Israel's prosperity. Again, it has been hinted at. Uh, she is a prosperous nation. I want to see the great change in the West Bank, which perhaps gives us a pointer forward. And then we will look at this 23-day uh, battle, was it? Uh, cast lead uh, and the Israeli elections. So this is from the Jerusalem Post at the end of last year. In tough times, Israel's high-tech sector thrives. From processors to software, from innovations in, in online video to security systems, from cell phone technology to better ways to stay, 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 stay safe on the road, Israel is there, at the forefront, designing and producing the high-tech wizardry that has changed the world. In a little more than a decade, Israel has grown into a high-tech powerhouse, with the technological boom fueling Israel's amazing GDP growth in, of the past few years. Nearly three quarters of Israel's $70 billion exports last year were in the high-tech sector, and the country has one of the highest per capita rates of patents filed. 
World Economic Forum and its 2007-8 report called Israel, one of the leading countries in the world in technological innovation, ranked first for available availability of qualified engineers and total expenditure on R&D. And along with that comes the economic boom. The high-tech boom, along with the solid fundamentals of Israel's economy, has helped the country sustain strong growth for decades, with GDP rising in most recent years. Israel has free trade agreements with the European Union, United States, European Free Trade Association, Turkey, Mexico, Canada, Jordan, Egypt. Industrial exports grew by 27% since the start of 2008. High-tech exports, 18.2. In other words, Israel is a bright, a very bright spot on the high-tech world map. Now, Ezekiel 38 described Russia coming down for a spoil and a prize. Uh, and Brother Ken said, well, this, this word for spoil can be, indicate people. This is what Russia is lacking, the high-tech skills that Israel has developed. She'll want to scoop up all these uh, technological experts and take them back to Russia to forward her own program. You can see the prize is very real. Nevertheless, Israel has been hit with the present economic crisis. Uh, she is facing a slowdown. Jobs are being lost. And uh, Israel's economy has been hit. It's going to get pretty gloomy, it says, but it's not going to be like the United States or Germany. It's going to be more of a slowdown than a recession. And one of the key differences is that the country's banking system is not in crisis. It's got a much more solid banking system. So Israel is suffering like the rest of the world. But the view is that she will weather the storm much better than most countries. And just as this is breaking, brothers and sisters, just as Israel is facing this downturn in her world markets, along comes this remarkable discovery of natural gas finds so huge that it can transform Israel's economy. Israel could be one step close to energy independence after drilling companies announced the discovery of extremely significant natural gas reserves an offshore drilling site in the Mediterranean, about 60 miles off the coast of Haifa. One massive pocket of natural gas is expected to contain more than 3 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, enough to feed Israel's energy needs for 15 years, lessening its dependence on foreign fuel. Now, last year, Israel spent uh, $12.8 billion on importing fuel. Uh, and here is this discovery... Uh, with a value, an estimated value, of $15 billion. Uh, and it's, they have discovered gas to the south of Israel, uh, off the coast, but this is three times greater. So it, it's been hailed in Israel as a historic moment for Israel. And in fact, they've done since those reports some more tests, and they're now talking about not three trillion, but five trillion cubic feet. Uh, of natural gas. So to put it in its context, that will make Israel number 48 in the world of uh, gas supplies. Britain, by contrast, has uh, number 32, which has got three and a half times greater reserves, but a much bigger population. So this is quite significant, uh, this uh, find. It's, as I said, uh, 60 miles, 100 kilometers offshore, but it, it is in Israeli territorial waters, and there are other adjacent sites, which they haven't yet drilled, which could yield equally large amounts. So we, we could see, in a short period of time, uh, a great strengthening of, of the power and the economic wealth of Israel. And when we know how Russia wants to control natural gas reserves. She's been in, to the forefront of having a natural gas cartel. And if there are big deposits here, she'll want to lay her hands on them. So let's look at the West Bank situation. Again, a remarkable picture. Uh, there was a heading in the Jerusalem port, a West Bank victory. Terror has been defeated in the West Bank. And this report explains how over six years, how the Israeli intelligence service, working with Fatah, who are in the West Bank, they have virtually eliminated 
uh, the terrorists. They have been systematically rooted out and all the bomb-making factories rooted out. And in great contrast to Hamas on Gaza, the West Bank is quite different. And this report showed that in the past year, 24% increase in daily wages earned on the West Bank. Unemployment has dropped by 3%. Uh, an increase of 35% in trade between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Tourism to the West Bank has also increased. 87% increase in the number of tourists visiting Bethlehem, 42% going to Jericho. Uh, total uh, income from the oil, from the olive harvest has been more than doubled. So that's interesting. When Israel and the Palestinians can work together, then it is bringing prosperity to the Palestinians. And the more prosperous they get, the less they'll want to wreck it all. And so perhaps we're beginning to see a way forward. If it can be shown that by cooperating with Israel rather than opposing her as Hamas has done, which has reduced the uh, Gaza Strip to great poverty, by cooperation there can be prosperity. And maybe this is the way forward to this time of peace and prosperity in Israel. Now, the contrast with Hamas, of course, is very marked and has led to car sled, and one might be wondering why it was called car sled. Well, it was a time of Hanukkah, and uh, at Hanukkah they used this uh, spinning top. It's used not only in gambling but in children's games. It's very much associated with Hanukkah. But uh, they're usually made from plastic or wood, but uh, the really solid ones are made from cast lead. And, of course, bullets are made, well, I don't know whether they still are, but from cast lead, so that was the connection. And the four letters engraved on these tops spell out in the Hebrew, a great miracle happened here, going back to the happenings uh, at Hanukkah. So this was in the minds of the Israelis when they had this code name of cast lead. A great miracle they were hoping would happen in the defeat of uh, the Hamas in Gaza. And just to give a bit of background, the, in the three years following Israel's withdrawal from Gaza, Nearly 5,000 rockets have been fired into Israel. And at the beginning of 2008 and the first four months, uh, the rate of rocket attacks was one rocket every three hours. And a quarter of a million Jews are now within rocket range with the improved range of the rockets. So Israel had to take action. But there had been a truce. Uh, and again, this graphically illustrates, these are the number of uh, rockets, um, rockets at the bottom and the missiles at the top there, 400 per month, 500, 600. And then came the truce when, you know, the numbers were uh, nothing. And then the truce ended, and instead of Hamas renegotiating a truce, they increased, in fact, in December, the beginning of December, we had the biggest concentration of rockets being fired at Israel. They were provoking Israel to take uh, revenge. Uh, and they had made their preparations, or so they thought. They had booby traps, civilian houses. They had built underneath mosques vast stores for their ammunition. They had uh, organized 500 trained suicide um, squads that were known as their doomsday weapon who were going to go with live ammunition among the Israeli troops and blow them up and blow themselves. And they expected, Hamas expected, to inflict great carnage on the Israeli troops when they knew Israel would come. If they provoked them enough, Israel would come. And Israel did indeed come. But the results were quite different. And in fact, it was in the first four minutes that Israel won the victory. The Israel Air Force demolished two key Hamas war systems in the first four minutes of its massive offensive on Saturday morning. They knocked out six mosques in Gaza City, holding the terrorists' biggest weapons arsenals. 
They knocked out scores of beehives containing launchers primed for automatic multiple launches of hundreds of powerful rockets rigged for precision targeting Israeli town centres. These were rockets they had never used before. They were the crim to the crim, and they had arranged them in banks that they were fire sequentially, remotely, when Israel attacked. But in the first four minutes, Israel knocked out all these, um, and 80% uh, of the rockets were knocked out, and it only left the inferior ones uh, which were launched at Israel. So it, it, the first four minutes was the key to their um, success in Gaza. And of the 35,000 Hamas troops, uh, there seemed to be only about 1,000 of them that did anything. Most of them donned civilian uh, clothes and melted away into the background. And none of the doomsday squad turned up. Uh, their communication systems totally failed. So... Israel was able to systematically uh, take out all these uh, places where the weapons were, very precise targeting of them, keeping casualties to the minimum. A lot of the casualties were due to the fact that Israel, in knocking out these key buildings, exploded the vast ammunition dumps that they had put under the bottom of the mosque and underneath people's houses, and it was their blowing up that did such a lot of damage. And in spite of all the stories, a repetition of what happened in Lebanon, uh, of the so-called atrocities that Israel had carried out, the shelling of the United Nations school and the firing of the aid convoys and the ambulance drivers, which subsequently all turned out to be untrue, uh, a lot of damage was done to Israel's reputation. Hamas was uh, right on the ball had been trained by the Iraqis uh, to have a very good public relations. So we had a, a great increase in anti-Semitic attacks, 300% jump. So what has been the outcome? Well, Israel has taken the brunt of um, people's anger. Uh, she has been blamed for pounding these innocent people. And so we say, has anything really changed in Gaza? Rockets are still being fired to this day. Rockets are still being fired at Israel. Hamas still is seeking Israel's destruction. But interestingly, interestingly, world opinion has finally swung against Hamas. In spite of all their PR, now it has become apparent of the utter brutality which, in which they murdered their Fatah um, rivals uh, just in cold blood shooting them uh, and using civilian human shields and the way that they hijacked uh, the UN aid has turned world opinion against Hamas. It's been quite interesting. Uh, for the first time, people can see Hamas for what they really are. Now, we're going to see how what happened here has begun to change the whole Arab world. But before we do that, I just want to look very briefly at the Israeli elections which took place three weeks ago with a, a surprising result. Um, Livni's Kadima party was thought to have lost, uh, and in fact she did lose a lot of support in the run-up to the elections, but surprisingly she gained, uh, well, she only lost uh, one seat. She just lost one seat. She gained the most seats, 28 seats. And Netanyahu, his Likud party, which was thought beforehand was going to wipe the floor, uh, he did gain 15 seats, but uh, he came second with 27 seats. And this outside party, almost, uh, they gained four parties. Israel, our home, very right wing, uh, came third. And uh, Barak's Labour Party, uh, they lost, 13, they lost uh, six seats, only got 13 seats. So quite, quite a, a mix-up. And with the complication of the Israeli elections, there are 120 seats in the Knesset, and one therefore has to 
cull together, uh, uh, pull together a combination to give you at least 61 seats so that you've got a working majority. And this is the process that is going on at the moment. Although Livni got the maximum number of seats, the 28 seats, it was seen that she wouldn't be able to pull together a coalition. And so Perez, the Israeli um, president, ha has asked Netanyahu to pull together a government. And he is very much trying to have a unity government uh, embracing all sides. Uh, so it would be very interesting to see. Uh, at the moment, Livni is saying, no, my party is not going to join you. If, if that continues, then he will have to take on the more right-wing parties, and we would have then, for the first time in Israel, a very right-wing party. And Netanyahu himself is one who stands for not giving up the Golan uh, and not dividing Jerusalem. Now, we know the other parties, they were quite happy to give up Golan. Uh, Omar was quite happy to talk about that kind of thing, but Netanyahu seems to be the one who is going to be the leader, just what the makeup will be remains to be seen. But he certainly stands for keeping the Golan, not dividing Jerusalem, and whereas the other parties are seeking this two-state solution. And he was very critical that Israel hadn't finished off Hamas uh, at the end of last year, the beginning of this year. So we, we will expect a shift which will keep Israel on the West Bank, which is what we have been looking for. Israel must dwell on the mountains of Israel. Uh, and this is the leader that could well move that forward. And if at the same time there is this shift in Arab opinion and this increase in economic wealth, we can see a quite different world rapidly uh, unfolding before our eyes. But again, the warning, as uh, our first two speakers have said, these things can take place after we have been called to the judgment seat. We shouldn't wait to see a time of peace and prosperity before the Lord come. That can well take place after we have been called. So let's look now at this uh, Middle East axis. Uh, and it's a thrilling area to behold because this was one of those areas that those who criticised our traditional understanding, especially in the 80s and the 90s, pointed the finger at the Middle East situation and said, you know, you've got it wrong, it can't be. And I've just uh, culled this from one of the writers. Uh, the assumption has always been made that art thou come to take a spoil, art hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, expresses a challenge to the invasion, as though Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish are springing to the defence of little Israel. And that's been our traditional understanding, but he says, that's wrong. Um, and to justify it, he gives an alternative uh, reading. The alternative proposed that these words might be read in a sense, you're coming to invade Israel and plunder Israel, jolly good, we're going to come and help you, which isn't our traditional understanding at all. But he, he justifies that, and remember we're talking the late uh, 80s. Since then, available Bible evidence, he says, points to Sheba and Dedan as Tarshish as being neighbouring Arab people, so not the evidence I've put forward. And since there is no Arab power today which does not hate Israel like poison, uh, oughtn't we to change our views and perhaps consider my alternative is what he's saying. Well, that could be true um, 20 years ago that the Arabs did hate Israel like poison. But we don't have to change our interpretation, brothers and sisters and young people. We just have to be patient. And things have changed. In the end, God's word will be vindicated. Now, we know that when Daniel's image stands upon its feet, it's representing the powers of the four empires that makes it up, the gold and the silver and the brass and the iron and the uh, clay and iron uh, feet. So we're looking at a, a power, the king of the north, Gog, to be a power that's going to come down upon Israel. And if we just link together the maps which illustrate the territories that are covered by those four elements, the gold, the Babylonian, and the um, Medo-Persian, and the Greece, and the Roman empires, and fit them together as a map, that very much covers the territory that we know will come together, Europe 
Uh, and Russia, of course, in these days, it was barbarian country to the north, but it's all going to be part of it. Those are the nations that are going to come with Ethiopia and Libya part of them. But there's going to come a time when, for a brief period, the king of the north power, Go, is going to have possession of Israel. But what is interesting is that never in the past has this particular area of Arabia been under the dominion of the four metals. It's always been deserts and nobody's been interested in that. But that is the very territory which in the latter days, Ezekiel 38 indicates, and from Daniel chapter 8 and uh, 11, we know there is a king of the south power, so a power to the south of Israel, who are friendly with Israel. And it is to this region that we look to this change in the Arab countries who are in possession of that region. Now, the, the modern world is made up of Shiite, and the majority are Sunni. Uh, they are quite different in their teachings, the Sunnis and the Shiites. Iran is Shiite, and the vast majority are Sunni. And we, shall, we are seeing a, a shift in the Arab feelings into two camps. There's one camp that will follow Iran, uh, and we find Syria in that camp, we find Libya in that camp, we find the Sudan or Ethiopia of Ezekiel um, in that camp. So we, we find a ring of na Arab nations who are very much pro-Iran, and we know that Iran is going to be part of the Northern Confederacy. So there's a grouping there, but in the middle, in this territory, uh, which was largely out of it, but belonged to the King of the South, Egypt belonged to the King of the South, we have Egypt and Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, the little Gulf states down there, and Oman, and even Yemen, it is beginning to turn away. At the moment, she's pro-Iran, but America is working very hard to pull Yemen back into uh, a Western uh, alliance. And so we see an inner axis uh, and an outer axis. The outer axis, part of the King of the North, <coughs> the inner one being part of the South, friendly to Israel. Now, if we just go back to nine months ago, the Arabs were holding a conference. It was chaired by Syria, brought great divisions in the Arab world. Uh, nations that attended, Mauritania right over there, uh, Algeria and Tunisia, Libya, uh, Sudan, the PLO were invited as well, uh, Kuwait and uh, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. They all sent high-level delegations. The, the problem was that Syria had invited Iran to come. Now, Iran is not an Arab country. It's a Muslim country, but not an Arab country. And that upset a lot of people, so that countries like Egypt and uh, Jordan and Saudi Arabia and uh, Yemen and uh, yeah, not in Yemen, they only sent low-level delegations. They, they protested. And some of them, like Morocco and Lebanon and Iraq and Dubai and Somali and Oman and Bahrain, didn't bother to send anybody. Now, again, that, that forms a little core of nations, a division between those who are pro-Iran and those who are protesting. Now, I have a confession to make. In Milestones, when I redid this, I've got the key wrong. I did it at the last moment, so nobody checked. It's all my fault. So just remember, it should go red, yellow, blue. Really young boy. Remember that. Alter your milestones. Right. Um, so it's dividing. We've got this inner core on the Sheba Dedan area who are... Uh, friendly to Israel. 
This is what was recorded at the end of Karsmid. More than ever, the Hamas war forced regional players to take sides and draw clear lines. Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia and all the Gulf states except Qatar did their best to give Hamas a cold shoulder. They had already muttered their discontent with Hezbollah during the Second Lebanon War. This time their anger was even more palpable. No amount of carnage instilled a sense of urgency among their leaders to stop Israel's war machine. They offered little more than rhetoric to Hamas, which is considered an even worse traitor than the Lebanese Shia. It is, after all, a sunny Arab movement that has turned its back on its brothers to embrace the feared and loathed Shiite Persian foe. The tacit, if grudging, alliance that emerges from all this between Israel and the pro-Western Sunni rulers, it is clear that the prospect of an Iran fomenting Islamic revolutions, wars and insurrections around the region under the cover of a nuclear umbrella is infinitely more terrifying than a Jewish state in the Arab heartlands. This new geostrategic environment should not pressure Israel into unhealthy concessions. The Arabs need Israel's steel against Iran today more than Israel needs their benevolence. So these nations, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi, recognize the value of having Israel as their defense against an emerging nuclear Iran power. And they helped Israel in this war. They fed them with information to help them against Hamas because Hamas is an extension of Iran. And, as I said, just as the Gogian nations, their companions, look to go to supply them with weaponry, so in these Gulf states, they're looking to Britain, to India, to America, to supply them with their weaponry. And these are just a few of the headlines I just uh, called out over the past year. So, NATO to network with Gulf states in security shield against Iran. Saudis, India, fostering new close military ties. How remarkable, India involved in this region. Saudis welcome US tech to secure oil sites. India concludes second strategic pact with the Gulf state. NATO, very much American, concludes first naval exercise with the Persian Gulf states. Before Bush leaves, Iraq was seeking six billion of US weapons to protect them against Iran. Um, United Arab Emirates uh, buying the THAAD system to protect them from missiles. Uh, and then this remarkable one last week, the, the United Arab Emirates are, are doing a deal with Israel to share um, spy satellite details from the Israeli satellites. A remarkable change around. Uh, well, that's what scripture said. There would be these nations working with Tarshish and the young lions who would be more friendly to Israel. Truly remarkable. And I want to draw your attention to a remarkable speech given by David Miliband. He's our foreign secretary. He is a Jew, but an atheistic one, which is very sad. But he was in the United Arab Emirates in November, and his speech was headed... Partnership in the Middle East with the Middle East. Sheba and Didan, working with the merchants of Tarshish. Didn't use those words. Uh, he set out the strong links that Britain has for the past 200 years with the region, known as the United Arab Emirates. He gave praise to the incredible developments in the area. In dealing with the problems that they faced, his proposal was for a 23-state solution. 22 members of the Arab League plus... Israel. It would be unthinkable for anybody to have stood up and said that ten years ago. But the unthinkable is happening. And I want to take you to another remarkable speech, this time by Brown, when he was in Israel back in July. This is what he said. And let me tell the people of Israel today, Britain is your true friend. A friend in difficult times as well as in good times. A friend who will stand beside you whenever your peace, your stability, your existence are under threat. A friend who shares an unbreakable partnership based on shared values of liberty, democracy and justice. And to those who mistakenly and outrageously call for the end of Israel, let the message be, Britain will always stand firmly by Israel's side. Wasn't that remarkable? 
Well, when we understand that his advisor is Martin Gilbert, a Jew who lives in this country, is perhaps not quite so remarkable because he is obviously very friendly to Israel, is Martin Gilbert, and friendly to the Christadelphians as well. Um, and uh, in, in November, the president of Israel was uh, in London uh, to be presented with the George Cross, and, uh, or the Grand Knight Cross, which is for important services in relation to the Commonwealth or foreign nations. So again, we see these links with the Tarshish power and Israel. Truly remarkable. Well, let's very quickly just look at our last uh, region, the financial crisis. Um, this very aptly sums up the situation that the world is facing, the whirlpools, the sirens calling the ship to go on the rocks, the banks on fire and collapsing into the water. Um, and we've seen banking collapsing, we've seen pension funds, insurance funds all drying up. Uh, we've had tremendous inflation and now it's suddenly dropped back and we're in a recession or is it uh, depression is the technical word now. Uh, and basically it's all due to the greed of man. The systems of banking that he has built up and Britain and America are to the forefront in this. It's all collapsed around the ears. The clay is very brittle and we're going to see more and more of it. Uh, and just how bad can it really get? Well, this was back in uh, October. This was the Daily Telegraph. And this was quoting the deputy a director of the Bank of England. And what he said was that this is possibly the largest financial crisis of its kind in human history. And uh, this uh, Jew, a child of Iranian Jews, uh, he is the uh, professor of economics at New York University who two years ago correctly forecast the, the very many crises that have taken place. And what he says is, I fear the worst is yet to come. In other words, we haven't seen the end of it. We're only at the beginning of it. And the Guardian, the 28th of October, gave an astronomical cost of all this, $2.8 trillion, has somehow disappeared into a black hole. It must be somewhere, but I can't find it. Um, but if, if we take the number of $1 notes in circulation, it's nowhere near enough. We've got to print 350 times more to be equivalent to the cost of this crash. Uh, 2.8 trillion one dollar notes would cover the uh, country of Wales one and a half times. This gives you some idea of, of the, the greatness of it. But that was in October. Now we've moved on and uh, middle of January we're told that just the Arab nations alone have lost 2.5 trillion dollars uh, and that's in the past four months. 2.5 trillion. That's just the Arabs, so let alone the other. Uh, and the, the housing market, I know housing market isn't tangible, but it, it reflects in it that it has lost just last year $3.3 trillion just in one year. And this is what the Daily Telegraph, uh, on the loss of jobs, 2.6 jobs lost in 2008, another 0.6 million uh, in January. Uh, of course, we're not at the end, we will be to tonight, but I, I guess that's going to be an even greater figure for the losses of jobs in February. And this is what the oh, Chinese, yeah, 20 million have lost their jobs. This is what the data are about to say, get there in the end. This financial crisis is now true, well, glo truly global. The financial crisis has moved from being a Wall Street to all streets as the economic shock causes strains and sufferings in every part of the world economy. Over the past months, we were told we were caught in the worst economic crisis for 20 years, then 30, then 80, then 100. It can't be long before somebody points out that really all things considered, the back death was comparatively pleasant. But beyond the hyperbole, one thing is clear. What began as a financial problem in certain debt-stoked nations is battering the economies of dozens of others, as well as millions of people working in almost every trade. It will change behaviour and alter the pecking order of the world's economies. There will be social unrest and changes of regime. Uh, and we've seen that already. Yeah, this is uh, pitching France. 
We've seen the riots in Greece. We've seen uh, protests in Ireland. We've seen protests in Britain. We've seen protests in Iceland about jobs. Uh, and uh, America has been warned that she might experience massive civil unrest in the wake of a series of crises, the financial crises. So it is grim. It's grim in Russia as well. Um, the stability of Russia is under threat because of the economy and the fall of the ruble has created great anger uh, and the uh, Russian army is feeling the pinch and they are uh, in revolt. So tense times in Russia. And yet the expert said, I didn't see the crisis coming. And yet, if he'd read his Bible, and he does claim to be a Bible reader, he would have known that at the time of the end, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And these are referring to the political heavens. We've seen the government in Belgium fall. We've seen the uh, government in Iceland fall. We've seen the government in Latvia fall. Uh, and there are several others are very tottering on the brink. And we're told, too, that the, the euro may indeed collapse under the pressures. So we're moving towards this situation that the Master talked about. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And we've seen nations, governments, being shaken. We're only at the beginning of it. And this uh, investor in America, who's uh, 78, says he's, he's never seen anything like it in the whole of his adult life. I don't think I've ever seen people as fearful what did Jesus say? When you begin to see these things happen, lift up your heads, your redemption draweth nigh. And so, brothers and sisters and young people, we have to consider our position. How are we going to face this economic crisis? I believe it's going to get much worse. And we can be faced with losing our job or losing our pension if we're retired. Things can get difficult. And that will be a true test of our faith. We've had 60 years of prosperity and peace. And that has been a testing for the brotherhood. But how much more, brothers and sisters and young people, when we lose our livelihoods, when our income has gone, it, it will make us prioritise our lives to see what is important in life and what isn't. And what is important is what does the Lord need? He doesn't need our possessions. We're going to leave them behind when we go to the judgment seat. We're going to take what our minds have developed. That's what's important. And so we have to concentrate on these things. And so, brothers and sisters, my final exhortation, we're nearly finished. Um, in our readings just a few weeks ago, we have recorded in the Gospels a two instances when the disciples were in the boat. One of them, Jesus, was in there, which Rembrandt is painting there. But in the second incident is a very important one because Jesus wasn't in the boat. It's the incident of the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus was on the mountainside. He sends, after feeding the 5,000, he sends the disciples away in a boat to go to Bethsaida, just a short little journey. And it tells us that after taking leave of them, he departs into a mountain. And that's shouting out to us. Here we have, in this literal happening we're having a parable being enacted jesus has gone into a high mountain he has said goodbye to the disciples the disciples are on the sea of nations and what happened instead of that little journey because of the tempest they went on a seven kilometer journey they didn't get to bethsaida they got to gennesaret and the account goes on in mark that Jesus comes to them, walking on the water. He sees them toiling in rowing, um, for the wind was contrary to them, and uh, John records that they'd gone about five kilometres, so they'd gone a good way on that journey. And about the fourth watch of the night, which is at dawn, Jesus comes to them. Uh, they see him, and they are fried, afraid, and... Uh, troubled, and he talks to them, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And uh, Matthew account talks of Peter going on the water. But he comes to them, the wind ceases, uh, and they are so amazed in themselves without measure and wondered. Uh, and it's John that adds, and immediately the ship was at the land 
whither they went. Doesn't this indicate to us, brothers and sisters, that when the Lord comes back to his brothers and sisters, we will be in tumultuous times. The seas and the waves will be roaring and it will be difficult. But he will come. And then for us, the, those problems will be over. The journey will be ended. Where did they get to? Gennesaret. What does Gennesaret mean? The Garden of the Prince. Think of all the links. The Garden of Eden paradise that we've been looking in that day you will be with me in paradise how wonderful these things are so brothers and sisters and young people have strength have courage the master is at the door the lord jesus is directing the angels to fulfill god's plan and purpose and soon all things will reach their climax and we want to be with the lord in that day we have to prepare ourselves now, strengthen our faith in these things, and wait and watch for his coming. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Don. I'll try and remember really young boy. Brothers and sisters we've, uh, 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 and friends and young people, we've covered a long geographical area today. We've been to Russia, we've been to Europe, we've been to the Middle East. And prophetically, we've looked also at scriptures that we know have been fulfilled because we've often quoted them. But maybe today we've seen scriptures that appertain to the present that we might not have thought of in a certain way. And we've been led into the future to the thrilling prophetical scriptures that are about to happen. I'm sure I can thank on your behalf our three speakers for the work they put in and also their thrilling words to us. And I'm sure that we've all had a very uplifting and spiritually uplifting day. Thank you.